Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending the NCADP Grassroots Film Promoter Screening and Training. We are excited to partner with you to bring this important award winning film in the execution of Shadow to your community. Tonight, we'll be reviewing the 16 minute clip of the documentary film In the Execution of Shadow. After viewing the clip, NCADP will be presenting our training, which is designed to give you the resources needed to organize your very own screening of this important film. The training is crucial in order to provide you with the key steps, education, and tips on how to raise the necessary funding in order to hold a film screening. We've created this grassroots film promoter program with the explicit goal to get as many people as possible to see this important film. We also hope that your film screening will encourage others and motivate others to hold similar screenings within their networks. We feel that this film is an excellent way to get the conversation about the death penalty moving forward and to build public awareness. Now, before we launch into the film, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty and the film In the Execution of Shadow. The National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty is the nation's oldest organization dedicated exclusively to the abolition of the death penalty. It leads a national movement against the death penalty fueled by a broad-based national constituency and more than 100 affiliate organizations. We are families of murder victims, persons from all points on the political and religious spectrums, past and present law enforcement officials, and prominent civil and racial justice organizations who are working to repeal the death penalty state by state. NCADP's most recent program, Justice Powered by Information and Action, is our educational outlet. Each month, through our JPIA program, we provide monthly webinars that explore where the death penalty intersects with other public policy and social issues. Whether it's mental health, religion, medical ethics, or a slew of other issues, our monthly webinar series is designed to educate you on how the death penalty crosses with other key issues of our day. And now a little bit about the clip you're about to see. In the Execution of Shadow has been called powerful storytelling and imbued with authenticity. The stories in this film are profoundly moving and designed to get people thinking, learning, and taking action to repeal the death penalty. We'd like to thank the filmmakers Richard Stack and Maggie Stogner, New Day Films, and the entire team at American University for allowing us to show this film and to use it to begin to shape the foundation of a strong, newly energized abolitionist movement. And now, please sit back, relax, and take in this impactful clip from the film in the execution of shadow. From 1978 to 1999, I served as the chief executioner. I performed 62 executioners in the 17 years. People that recommend the death penalty, the jury, the judge, if they had to perform the execution, I think that they would in light a different story on giving the death penalty to anyone. The United States is the last country in the developed West to execute criminals. About 50% of Americans are for the death penalty and 50% against it. Our capital uh, punishment system is flawed. This is not a matter of vengeance. It's a matter of justice. The death penalty, we believe, serves as a deterrent. Capital punishment is tainted by racial disparity. 
Having my father's killers executed did not bring me a sense of closure. Is it to restore society or is it to punish? If you take a life, shouldn't your life be taken? Justice is about us as a society. Nineteen eighty two was my first execution. I was a correctional officer. One of my main jobs were to save my lives. So when it came down to execution, I had to transform myself into a person that would take a life. Jerry Gibbons was appointed executioner in nineteen seventy seven when the United States reinstated the death penalty. He grew up in the housing projects of Richmond, Virginia, and remembers one tragic night at a party. When I was a teenager, I witnessed a young lady uh, being shot to death right before my eyes. I wanted revenge for the young lady because she was innocent. I was totally for the death penalty. My thing is that uh, if a person takes the a life of another person, then that person's life should be taken, and that's what I believe. Jerry received training to operate the electric chair and later to administer lethal injections. He became chief executioner in 1982. I would say my team members take pride in their work, their preparations, uh, getting this person ready for his next step in life prepare him to just to see his kids for the last time, a, a last kiss of his mother or sister, or even his wife or daughter. We all are human, you know, and this is one human that had made a mistake, and uh, we had to carry out the orders. Outside of his team of eight, Jerry told no one about his work as an executioner, not even his wife. We would keep it a secret, and I kept it a secret from my, my family. Since 1977, he and other executioners across the United States have put over 1,460 people to death. It's a punishment that's supposed to be reserved for the worst of the worst. It was a gorgeous day. It was a beautiful April morning. We met some friends in, in Boston. 23,000 runners and half a million spectators gathered for the Boston Marathon. Karen Brassard, her husband and daughter, were cheering a friend over the finish line. We were there for maybe 10 or 15 minutes all excited with the crowd, watching everybody come through, and just suddenly it was this incredibly loud explosion. There were seven of us there. Six of us were injured. One of our dear friends lost both of her legs that day. I knew that my husband was pretty badly injured. My daughter had shrapnel from her hips to her feet. And I had shrapnel in both of my legs. The two blasts injured over 260 people and killed three including Crystal Campbell, Lingzi Liu, and eight-year-old Martin Richard. Police pursued two brothers in a dramatic manhunt. Twenty-six-year-old Tamerlan Zarnayev was killed in a shootout. A day later, police captured the younger brother, Zokar, alive.
Over the next few months, Karen, Ron, and their daughter, like many of the bombing victims, had to undergo multiple surgeries. I'm going to try to not let this change who I am. I'm not going to let this prevent me from living the life that I want to live. I'm not going to be afraid. Later that summer, Karen traveled from her home in New Hampshire to Boston for Zarnayev's arraignment at the federal court. We were all seated together, and he walked out. He didn't look at any of us, but his hand was obviously injured. And my immediate response was, I hope that hurts. I hope it's painful. That was not like me. And the recognition of that about me was scary because that isn't who I am. Zarnaev pled not guilty to all 30 counts, 17 punishable by death. The federal prosecutor asked victims if the U.S. should seek the death penalty. I don't know. I, um, I don't know. I don't know what justice is. I thought I knew. What does society do when someone commits a horrific act of violence? For centuries, seeking justice was a community affair. And disproportionate blame fell on the poor, mentally disabled, and people of color. In the 1800s, some capital offenses were targeted specifically at slaves, establishing a racial bias that continues today. Executions reached a historic peak in the 1930s, averaging 167 per year. But then, in 1936, a gruesome execution caught the attention of the media. On August 14th, in Owensboro, Kentucky, Rainy Bethia was publicly hanged by a white sheriff. Many thought Bethia was innocent. One New York Times reporter wrote, 10,000 white persons, some jeering and others festive, saw a prayerful black man put to death today on Davies County's Pitt and Gallows. The outcry over Rainy Bathia's hanging did not put an end to capital punishment. Instead, it drove executions behind prison walls out of public view. State officials built death houses and institutionalized the practice. It's a death by formula. It's a scripted death. In the beginning, it was hanging. It was not only hanging, but it was public. And so you see the crowds coming and bringing a picnic lunch and celebrating. Then we moved from hanging to the electric chair. And then we began to have the horror stories that happened out of the electric chair. And then there's been the move to lethal injection. And lethal injection, it's like we're going medicinal so that we'll just be putting them to sleep. But not everyone agrees. The idea that they should go out in an opiate haze, that it should be a pleasant death, is absolutely perverse. The debate about the death penalty has become increasingly polarized and politicized. We want a system that's fair. We want a system that respects the dignity of, of human beings. The idea that we were executing innocent people was terrifying, and there was just no way that we hadn't and that we weren't. Some people kill with an attitude so callous, heinous, sadistic, that they have forfeited their right to live. I believe in a deterrent of one, and that is when we execute this person, we know he will never kill again. Why is it 
that the death penalty really comes down to, in many cases, just where you live, who your DA is. We can all recognize injustice when we see it. It's people not being treated fairly. It's people not getting a fair shot. You can be critical of the death penalty. You can be critical of the idea that the government has the right to kill and also hold compassion and concern for victims. Maybe in some books of justice, the person for this act deserves to die, but do we? as a society, deserve to kill them. Today, capital punishment largely falls to the state in which the crime was committed, and laws and methods vary widely. Most states use lethal injection, but some still use gas chambers, the electric chair, hanging, and firing squads. In Philadelphia, nearly four years after Vicki and Sill's daughter Shannon was murdered, the police got a lead. In 2001, there had been a series of assaults started taking place out in Fort Collins, Colorado. They put out a, a report to police agencies all across the United States. So they sent DNA from Shannon's case to Fort Collins. The DNA was a match. The suspect was married and employed at an Air Force base. So about 8 o'clock that night, 23rd day of April, uh, 2002, this fellow and his wife walked into the police station. And by midnight that night, they had a full confession for the dozen different cases. The man they arrested was 29-year-old Troy Graves. Philadelphia's elusive Center City Rapist. Graves was accused of multiple counts of sexual assault and one count of murder in the death of Shannon Sheber. The prosecutor was District Attorney Lynn Abraham. The prosecutor in the city of Philadelphia, who is known as a pretty deadly DA, in other words, she put more people on death row, than uh, uh, any other prosecutor in Pennsylvania and probably any a large number around the country. Troy Graves was found guilty and the district attorney wanted the death penalty, but the Shebers did not. It meant they would have to fight for the life of their daughter's killer. We had said to each other and consulted with our very large families that what would we do if they ever caught him? Well, we would stick to our principles. You know, if someone was going to want him put to death, we were going to argue for life without the possibility of parole. The district attorney voiced her disagreement and outrage. The district attorney there became very, very upset, and she became very public with her, with her opinion. And she said, I don't care what the Shebers said. The death penalty was the appropriate sentence for their daughter's murder. Why would they not want it? For Vicki and Syl, the answer was clear. We just can't let this anger, this natural human anger and pain overwhelm us and, and make us so vengeful and, and hateful because it would just, over time, destroy us. And we knew that. Vicki and Syl received piles of hate mail, accusing them of not loving their daughter. You know, if you can't stand by your principles when it's difficult, they're not your principles. And now you can see why we want to bring that very powerful movie, um, the whole movie, um, to your community. Um, welcome back to our, our screening and training. Um, you've just seen a, a small 16 minute clip of in the execution of shadow. And before we get into the actual, um, training, I wanted to just give you a little bit more information, uh, about the film in the execution of shadow. The film is available to stream or buy through DVD. 
The DVD contains two versions, a 40-minute version, a 54-minute version, a 10-minute Q&A, which includes members of the film and leading prominent anti-death penalty activists, and also an accompanied study guide. The film DVD costs $75. A streaming option is also available, also at $75. The streaming allows you to rent the film for a 14-day period. Now, please note, if you're purchasing the streaming version of the film, you have 14 days from the time of purchase to show the film. So please do not purchase the film until you have your secured venue, date and time of your film screening set. And now I wanted to get into our slide presentation on how to create and organize a film screening. This training is designed to help you organize your film screening and to give you tips on how to raise funding to for your screening and educate you to provide the resources you need to make your screening a success. Each participant on this webinar will receive via email the PowerPoint presentation that I'm about to run through so you can refer to the tips and resources contained within the PowerPoint when planning your screening. The first step in organizing a film screening is to raise the necessary funding in order to make your event a success. Now we have compiled some helpful tips that may assist you in creating a film screening that will be a powerful impact towards the abolitionist movement. The first key step is knowing what you need. We ask you to assess your costs, create a budget, and then set your fundraising goals. Now, like I said, streaming or buying the DVD costs $75. So $75 should be your first line budget item. Some of the other costs that may be associated with this film are printing costs, DVD rentals, venue rentals, and refreshments. In order to make contributing to the film easy and straightforward, NCADP has identified a number of websites to streamline the fundraising process while providing promotional help as well. Among the other steps helpful towards raising funding for your film are sending a fundraising letter to your family and friends, and meeting with local community leaders, student government associations, local or state anti-death penalty organizations, and area businesses, and asking them to sponsor your film. In addition, the social media network Facebook allows users to create a fundraiser for your film screening. Via Facebook, you can share and connect your fundraiser through your entire network to learn more about how to create a fundraiser, donate, and encourage your friends to contribute to your cause. You can follow the link embedded in the PowerPoint that I will be emailing to you after the webinar to learn more about the Facebook option. One easy way to raise the money for the film is to solicit donations for the screening. Donations can be asked for and suggested to any guest attending your screening. Now, please note, you're not allowed to charge admission for the film. However, you may ask for a donation, and you can allow for interested parties to choose from a range of donation amounts, or you can choose a donation required in order to attend the event. We also recommend that we're going to create an Eventbrite invitation page. Once you have your film screening venue, location, time, and date secured, NCADP will work with you to create an event by page for your film screening. This online invitation and ticket portal will allow you to collect donations, secure participants, and keep track at RSVPs. During this stage of your planning, you'll be working with me, Gregory Joseph, NCADP, on the creation and monitoring of your event by page. Now, we want you to decide what is the best event that you can create. Now, there are two types of events you can create for your film screening. You can host as an individual in a small setting, or you can partner with an organization and create a larger 
film screening. The NCADP Grassroots Film Promoter Program is designed to create community engagement events. It is our hope that you will create a film screening that is open to the public and designed to attract as many eyes to the film as possible. Community engagement events function as an entry points for people who are concerned about the issue of the death penalty. Community engagement events like film screenings are a perfect opportunity to educate and motivate supporters about the range of issues surrounding the death penalty. We also encourage our grassroots film promoters to partner with other organizations to make your screen screening a reality. Partnering with another organization can quickly expand your promotional opportunities and provide you with a ready-made list of invitees. When partnering with an organization, you can tack your film screening onto their established meetings. Many organizations hold monthly or quarterly meetings when their membership are present and your film screening can be part of the agenda. Be remember to check local organizational and community calendars for conflicts before choosing your film screening date. For example, if you're partnering with the local ACAU chapter, you don't want to choose the date when the organization is away on a two-day retreat. You can also create smaller individual events. These types of events are usually held in home and attended by a smaller network. An individual event, you'll be working on your own or organizing a team of your choosing to plan the event. Now here are a few things to keep in mind when planning in an in individual event. Be mindful of who you want to invite. Friends, family, co-workers are always a good first step. If your event is in a public space like your home or office, you can use so if your event isn't in a public is in a public space like your home and office, you can use social media to promote your event. Be mindful of capacity. Know how many people can comfortably sit in the venue of your choosing. If there's limited capacity, you'll have to limit the number of RSVPs. Remember, you can't fit 50 people into a space that only holds 25. And also, please be sure that there's ample and comfortable seating. Remember, this film runs 54 minutes with a Q&A and discussion length of your choosing, and people cannot stand or sit uncomfortably for the entire event. Make sure that the venue you choose has the appropriate equipment available. In order to see this film, you'll either need a television and DVD player, a computer projector or screen, and make sure there's sufficient audio. Make sure in your planning process, you also realize that there needs to be ample parking for your, for your guest. And at the event, make sure there's someone there who has technical skills available to run the equipment. Remember, you're the host of this event. And you need to be there to welcome guests, introduce people, make sure guests are signing in and receiving the appropriate handouts. You can't be worried about whether or not the DVD player is hooked up properly. Now let's review some information that will be helpful for those interested in creating more of a community engagement event. The first step is to secure and locate a venue. Schools, libraries, community centers, bookstores, places of worship, and even some cafes, restaurants, and bars all make for good locations for your screening. As with an individual event, please make sure that the venue of your choosing is easily accessible to your guests with ample parking and or close to public transportation. Before you settle on a venue, make sure you visit the location in person so you can determine the logistical details like accessibility, location of electrical outlets, the availability of screens and audio, internet, internet connection, and of course, to make sure there's appropriate seating. And also, if there is a space available to serve as a check-in and sign-in area, that is a double bonus. We want your screening to be inclusive, so please pay attention to the following. Make sure that you initiate the closed captioning option on your DVD so people with hearing impartialities can enjoy the film. Provide closer seating options for those with heroin impairments. Ensure that the venue has wheelchair access, and if possible, provide a sign language interpreter for the Q&A portion of the event. And remember, when promoting your event, make sure the accessibility is part of your promotion, as many people with hearing and sight difficulties will often check in advance to see if a venue has the facilities they need. Invitations are important and we want you to invite your network, but you also can use this opportunity to invite special guests. A special guest can be someone 
of local stature within your community, like the mayor, a local city council member, a judge, lawyer, a local athlete, TV newscasters or radio personalities, a well-known journalist or newspaper columnist, or university college or university and college professor. Now, promoting your event is very important, and we are looking to do promotions on three different levels, before, during, and after your event. To promote during your event, we want you to advertise your film screening via emails to your networks, flyers that can be posted in local area businesses and organizations, and with social media graphics. As part of your NCADP digital toolkit, which we'll be emailing to you shortly, we provide a six-week social media calendar complete with sample social media posts and graphics that you can simply cut and paste into your existing social media accounts. Also ensure to invite friends, neighbors, coworkers, and acquaintances, and thought leaders from out your community. Tag them on all your social media posts and help them, ask them to create and expand the dialogue. To promote the screening during your event, we ask you to utilize the live broadcast functions on Facebook and Instagram to document the setup and offer a behind the scenes look at what's going on. These types of postings can make your audience feel included and involved in the whole entire process. And of course, make sure to post photos, videos, and quotes from the film on social media throughout the event. And promoting the screening after the screening is over because promotion doesn't end once the screening is concluded. Here are a few ways to keep the dialogue going. On social media, publicly thank your guests and any special guests that might be there. Reply, retreat, and engage. The goal is not to have a one-sided conversation. You can create a poll on Facebook or on Twitter and post it on your social media and let the conversation begin. Make sure you take photos and share and tag the subjects and all the photos and post them on your social media. And if you take any video, edit it down and also post that on your social media. And you can also transcribe any answers from the Q&A and write them up as a series of blog posts. And you can create your own personalized blog post using the website Medium. What happens after the film is also important because we want the dialogue about the death penalty to begin within your screening. So creating an opportunity for a post-screening discussion is vital. You might wanna consider organizing a speaker or a panel of speakers to lead the discussion after the film. An NCADP can work with you to assist you in finding a local expert knowledgeable about the death penalty to lead your post-film discussion. If you're unable to land a local expert, here are a few tips that are helpful for you to lead the post-film screening Q&A and discussion. Use the questions provided in the NCADP digital toolkit to, to kickstart the conversation. Share the structure of the discussion before the event so your guests know what to expect. After the film, break your guests up into groups and have them discuss certain aspects of the film and then share their discussion points with the full audience. And field questions from the audience, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Here's a, and here's a few tips about hosting an event. Because remember, outside the film, you are the star of the show. And here are a few things that are helpful in making your screening a welcoming event. We recommend that you create a run of show or a timeline or agenda of how your film screening event will come about. Plot out the times and portions of when the events of the evening will occur. For example, from 7 to 7.30, mix, mingle, and refreshments. 7.45, welcoming. 750 screening the movie in the in the ex execution shadow 825 q a also welcome the audience before starting the film thank people for coming and tell them the schedule for the evening and this is also a good time to get rid of and put together any housekeeping like turning off and silencing your cell phones and pointing out where the restrooms are this is especially important if the event is being held in a private residence. Like we said before, this is a community engagement exercise. So we really want people to be involved. And so a sign-up list is vital. NCADP will be providing you an online registration link that your guests can use in advance. But in addition to the online registration, please have a sign-up list available at check-in so guests can leave their information. 
You can also pass the guest to sign up list around to the audience prior to the film and during your welcome announcement, encourage people to sign up. The NCADP Digital Toolkit, where you'll be receiving shortly, has a sign-up sheet that you merely have to print out and leave at your check-in station. We also encourage you to use name tags because having name tags available for the audience members to fill out and wear throughout the event will encourage greater conversation and connection between your audience. And as I referenced before, question cards. Have index cards present at the sign-in for people to write down questions for the Q&A portion of the event. Encourage questioners to mark down their name, city, and any organization they might belong to. And as the moderator of the Q&A, please remember to recite this information before asking a question. At the end of the event, we've designed an online survey for guests to fill out. These surveys are instrumental in helping us provide the most effective programming moving forward. We will provide a link for your guests to fill out the NCADP online survey online, or you can simply print out the survey, which is also included in your digital toolkit. Now that we've run through a few steps on how to organize a film screening to raise the necessary money to promote it and how to make sure the dialogue after the film screening is educational and robust, let's talk about the next steps. You'll be working with me, Gregory Joseph of NCADP, pretty closely on organizing your film screening and making sure it's, an, it's a success. For those who are interested in organizing a public event, we ask you to first go out and find a location, a date, and a time, and secure that date, location, and time. Once you find that event, location, date, and time, I will work with you to create an invite on Eventbrite to promote your event and to begin to solicit donations you need. In addition, once we have all the information, NCADP will design personalized flyers that you can use on social media and post in any area locations. And here's something that you can write down my email address. It is Gregory Joseph, G Joseph at ncadp.org. I will be available to you at all times to answer any questions and help you ensure that your film screening is a success. And, and now if you have any questions about what you've just seen in terms of the PowerPoint presentation or about what it means to be a grassroots film promoter, you can feel free to write them into the chat section and I can answer them now or I can simply link back with you on email um, if you have any questions. But that concludes our training and screening of the evening. And I'd like to thank you again once again for your time this evening. I'd like to thank again Rick and Maggie, um, the filmmakers for In the Execution of Shadow, and all of my colleagues at the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and all of you for joining us for the screening. Now, I hope that we can go out and put this movie into every part of this country and beyond and bring as many people to see this important film as possible. Um, I will be in touch with all of you over email, and until you hear from me tomorrow, enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you for your dedication to the abolition of the death penalty.